dude, I don't, I don't hunt. He's like, I know that's the point. I want to teach you. I want to coach you and give you an experience. Over 500 guys are members of the Iron Council now. So we're having conversations and discussions and holding each other accountable. There's no hats. It's just your life. And we've all heard the term, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. That's true. You got to hustle. You got to grind. It's like, dude, I don't want to hustle and grind all the time. Sometimes I just want to be here and I want to roll around in the front room with my kids. There's no negative emotions. Guilt, fear, sorrow, they're not bad. It's what you do with that emotion. It's the outcome or the response to that emotion that's going to be good or bad. This is Ryan Mickler, the founder of Order of Men, and you are listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. You and I and everybody listening to this owns 640 million acres. I think he killed more deer drinking his coffee, smoking a cigarette in the pickup truck than I did spending all that time freezing my butt off. Something that I would hope is that people realize that those are wild animals and they have savage natures. I look forward to packing animals out. I look forward to that pain of success. Doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you live. I've said it before and you know what, I'll say it again louder for the people in the back. Your present circumstance should not limit your passions. This is Jay Scott of the Jay Scott Outdoors podcast. Hey, this is Ryan Callahan. Hi, this is Jules McQueen. Hey everybody, Jason Carter here with Epic Outdoors. Hey guys, this is Tim Burnett with Solo Hunter. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey y'all, welcome to episode 128 of The Wild Initiative. Today, I am sitting down with Ryan Mickler, founder of The Order of Man. Ryan, thanks so much for uh, hopping on the line with me today. Glad to be here. Looking forward to it. So one thing I always like to start out with is really just a little bit of an introduction of, about yourself. How did, you, uh, uh, how did you get your kind of introduction to the outdoors and, and hunting and fishing? Yeah, I, you know, I so I, I grew up until I was about 13 years old in Southern California in the city. So I didn't really spend a whole lot of time outdoors. Uh, my mom who raised my sister and I pretty much exclusively uh, took us took us maybe camping once a year. And every time we went camping, we enjoyed it, but we were at a, a campground, you know, it was like, it, it was very structured. It wasn't just like go to the mountains and find a place and do it on your own. And that was really all I knew until I was about 13 years old. Then when I was uh, 13, 14 years old, I moved to a small town in Southern Utah and uh, it was very rural, right at the base of a, of a mountain. Um, and all the guys, all my buddies, they were outdoors and they were hunting and they were fishing and spending time hiking around and just being outside. So that was kind of my introduction to it. Uh, I never really got into hunting when I was younger. Uh, I remember the first year that we were there in Southern Utah, uh, they had what they called fall break, which for in in high school, which more aptly would have been called hunting break because that's what it was. (laughs) It was, it was, it was the break during the, uh, the first week of the uh, season opener for, for, uh, for rifle or maybe archery. I can't remember. Um, and I remember, you know, high school kids, they'd be driving around with rifles hanging in the back of their pickup truck. And I'm like, what in the hell? Like, where did we move? You know, cause I'm the city <laughs> boy. And then, uh, a couple of days later, I remember driving around town and we'd see all these dead deer hanging from the out, outside outdoor basketball hoops that people had outside in their driveways. And there was like deer, deer, deer everywhere we went. I'm like, what is this place? Uh, but as I, as I made buddies and made friends with the guys who were hunting and fishing and things like that, um, we did, I did, I got very involved with fishing, which is funny cause I don't even like fishing now. Um, and we can talk <laughs> maybe a little bit more about that, but, uh, yeah, my got my buddies got me into fly fishing. We all had float tubes and we'd go spend, you know, the weekend out on the lake and try to catch fish and we'd fish the streams and the rivers and man just had, just had a really good time. And I guess maybe if I did that again, I would enjoy it, but I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go sit on the shore of a, of a lake and just sit there all day and like wait for something. That's, that's hard for me to do. (laughs) Same thing with sitting in the stand. Like it's really, really hard for me to do. Uh, so that was basically the extent of any, any fishing or hunting, uh, in high school. And then, uh, several years ago, so this would have been 2017, probably about this time, uh, I had a a listener at the time. His name's Colin Cottrell. Uh, he was listening to the podcast and he said, Hey man, I know you don't hunt, but 
I'd love to, I'd love to introduce you to hunting. Uh, I've got some property down here in Texas. A friend of mine has, and he wants to manage this land. He wants us to shoot a couple of small bucks. Would you be interested? I'm like, well, dude, I don't, I don't hunt. And he's like, I know that's the point. I want to, I want to teach you. I want to coach you. I want to, I want to show you and, and give you an experience. I said, yeah, all right, let's do it. And that happened to be an archery and a rifle hunt. So I, I bought a bow and I, I think I shot for maybe a couple of months leading up to the hunt and got my rifle all sighted in and dialed in. I mean, I'd, I'd shot guns. I was in the military, but never hunted with one. And, uh, well, yeah, I went down there first day I was out there, shot a, uh, shot a deer. In fact, if you guys are watching this, that deer right there was my very first deer and, uh, really cool. Just like really interesting character. And the guy that was managing the property, uh, Clay is his name. He wanted us to get that out of the property, right? Bad genetics. Cause that's an old deer, but you can see it's just a weird rack. So old, gen uh, uh, bad genetics. And he just wanted to get him out of there. So that's what I did. Um, yeah, so shot that with a, with a rifle. And then I think two or three days later, ended up taking another deer with my bow. And from that moment, I was hooked. Um, you know, you can see this, this right here. That's a sheep, a black Hawaiian sheep that I shot on the island of uh, the big island of Hawaii. Um, and I've been to Arizona and Minnesota and Texas multiple times, just trying to get as many hunts as I possibly can in because I've just been having a lot of fun with it and, and connecting with nature and being outside and the brotherhood and the camaraderie and the learning. It's all been, it's all been amazing. And that's been a period of two years, like I said. So I, I do have to ask where in Southern California did you grow up? Uh, the Anaheim area, your Belinda specifically, but Anaheim. Oh, very familiar. I grew up in uh, like Seal Beach Garden Grove area. Okay. So <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Not not too far away. Yeah. I, I uh, it was interesting because when I moved to Southern Utah, there was there was more kids in the high school that I would have went to in California than the entire population of Parallel, which was uh, Parallel's <laughs> a small town in Utah I moved to. There was uh, I I, I want to say if I remember correctly, this has been twenty years now. It seems to me, if I remember correctly, there was like 41, 42 people in our graduating class. So very, very small town. Um, it, was, it was hard at first, but I, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. It was so good for me. So um, I feel like it's a very interesting uh, kind of path. Your podcast and, and your, I guess, brand, The, the Order of Man, um, you really focus on masculinity. Would that be an accurate, uh, I mean, accurate way to kind of sum it up in a word? Yeah. It's, it's centered a around masculinity. And yeah. uh, I, I find it to be such an interesting, interesting path because you see that a lot. A lot of guys that, that don't hunt, but they're, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this, but they're, they're, they want to focus on getting back to the roots of masculinity and this, and they mm -hmm. start taking this path of focusing on, on that. And I feel like it does all almost inevitably lead to the wilderness, to, um, to harvesting your own meat and, and that connection with nature and self-sufficiency and, and stuff like that. What, I mean, what do you see that a lot through, through kind yeah. of what yeah. you've been doing with Order of Man? I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't suggest that, that you're an inferior man if you don't happen to hunt. I, I wouldn't go that far, but I think it's very attractive. It's very appealing for men, especially men who want to be more masculine, who want to tap into that because hunting is primal. I was in uh, Washington, DC. This was about a month ago and we were at the Smithsonian and they had this really cool statue. It happened to be a, a, a female and she was carrying this animal I don't remember what it was at the time and it was like so intriguing and and I kind of looked in that area and they had this spear that was obviously whittled out of a branch carved out of a branch straightened up and then right next to it they had a bone of a horse and there was a hole in the bone and I read the caption and it was it was that that horse had likely been killed by a spear that a human being or 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 our early ancestors had had made in order to you know hunt this was millions of years old <laughs> that's what was crazy to me is millions of years old it's it's ingrained into who we are hunting is literally in our blood 
And if somebody wants to tap back into their primal roots, especially as a man, then this is an avenue that will take you down that path. It's not the only route. It's not even a necessity, frankly. But if you are interested in tapping into your primal roots, then you will go on a hunt and you will learn how to harvest an animal and you will take an animal's life, which is a big responsibility. I think a lot of people looking from the outside in think that hunters are cold blooded killers who don't care about nature or the wildlife or the animal that they're killing. The, that's the furthest thing from the truth. I remember that first the, the deer that you're looking at right here. I remember walking up on that deer and seeing this magnificent animal lying in front of me thinking you did that. You killed that animal. And that was a, a sobering realization that that animal died in my hands. Now people will say, well, how can you do that? How, how can you, how can you come to terms with that? Well, I come to terms with that because I honor that animal by the way that I prepared for the hunt. Uh, I honor the animal by the respect that I treat it, even in death. Like I don't, I'm, I'm not mocking it or making light of the situation. Uh, I, I come to terms with that because then I put food on the table and me and my family and my friends sit around the table and we eat food and we consume things that we know where they came from. We know what kind of life they lived. We know it's healthy. The, these animals weren't you know, exposed to slaughtering houses and, and all the atrocities that go on there. It's, it's something that I can easily rectify, um, but it's harder to see unless you're immersed in it. So you know, I have a lot of guys that ask me, you know, how do you get into hunting or what, what can I do? Because they are interested. And the more we move away from this primal desire to provide as men, the more appealing I think it becomes for guys who really want to go down this path and become better men. Well, and I think when, you know, again, like you said, it's not, Men that don't hunt, they're not lesser men, um, you know, and I would never, never want people to, to think, you know, I, I was, I was heading that direction, but I feel like as you kind of dig deeper into masculinity and life in general, when you start integrating hunting into your life, it, it almost becomes inextricable from it. It's, it's once you, once you've brought it in, it ties into so much of of life because like you said it's feeding your family it's mm -hmm. the health aspect of it i mean you know as men we want to uh we want to be strong and healthy and i mean it's again kind of that primal desire i think to to protect and and to care for our families um and eating eating healthy is such an important aspect of that and um it's 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 interesting yeah it's not it's not a requirement to be a man to, to hunt, but once you, I think once you integrate it into your life, it's very, it's almost, it's, it's like nigh impossible to then remove it <laughs> again. Yeah. And well, you don't even want to. Yeah. Because you know, it enhances your life so much. And that could be said about anything really, right? Whether it's hunting or painting or jujitsu or other, some, some other form of martial arts or, riding motorcycles or whatever, whatever your thing is, that can really be said about anything that it actually just becomes part of you. And it should, that's the point. A lot of people talk about hats, especially men. Like I have this hat of, of a dad and this hat of now I'm a father and now I'm a husband and now I'm a, an employer or an employee or, you know, or I'm a coach. And so they try to compartmentalize their life. There's no hats. There's just your life. And we've all heard the term, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. That's true. You know, you, you, you can't separate your life out that way. So when you have these experiences, again, whether it's hunting or, you know, one another thing that I'm really involved with lately is jujitsu, whether it's hunting or martial arts, again, anything that becomes part of who you are. And hunting is a, is a beautiful thing. It's a positive thing. It's an amazing experience. It's challenging. It's frustrating. It's rewarding. Um, it's practical. Uh, it's it's just a great part, to, a, a great dynamic to add into your life. Hunting, it's one of those things, you know, you say it's, you talk about kind of that dichotomy of it's frustrating and exciting and rewarding, all that. It's, 
it's one of those few things in life. Like there's a handful of things you can do that you can effectively fail completely at, but still be 100, find 100% rewarding and satisfying at the same time. Like, I mean, and when I say fail completely, I mean, in the, in the way of not, not filling a tag. Yeah. Not harvesting um, the animal. Of course. Yeah. And you know, we can go I mean, into that's a whole your thing objective, about, right? Ultimately, that's what you're trying to do. Exactly. You, you go out there to kill an animal. If you don't kill an animal, you didn't complete the objective. Can you still be fulfilled? Sure. Just like you're saying, you know, I've, I can't even tell you how many, I don't even want to admit how many shots I've missed, but that's part of the process too. And, you know, I think we inherently and instinctively know that through the challenge comes reward. That's why if you take something as, as simple as a, a video game, like you don't want all the codes to the video game. <laughs> and, and if you do get all the codes, cause you go jump online and Google it and get the codes to the video game, like you grow tired of it pretty quickly. Cause that's not what we want. We want to grow. We want to excel. We want to get better. We want to improve. And we instinctively and inherently know that the challenge and the struggle is what makes you better. So if you strip away the, the, tr the struggle and the challenge, you know that you're not pushing yourself. You know you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not evolving and getting better, and therefore you get bored. It no longer holds your attention. So that's why I think, to your point, you can go out on a hunt and fail utterly and miss a bunch of shots and, or not see an animal at all or, or make some other stupid decision and, and spook a bunch of animal that you're trying to hunt. There's all, all sorts of things that can go wrong. And at the same time, it's the challenge that makes it rewarding and fulfilling. If that wasn't there, like who, here, here's an example. Who loves going grocery shopping? <laughs> like nobody loves to go to, to, the, to, the, to the meat counter and, and, and pick out food. You know, they do it because we need to eat and it's convenient. So we get the steaks and we throw them on the, the, the Traeger or whatever else and we eat it. But like who's passionate about the, the deli? or the meat counter at the grocery store. Nobody is, because it's easy, it's simple. And, and that's a, a perfect example of how the challenge is what makes it rewarding. I mean, if you are honestly succeeding at everything you do, how, I mean, how satisfied can you be with that? I mean, <laughs> right. like, like it, it sounds like, it sounds like the weirdest thing to say, but like, you know, you would think uh, like conventional wisdom would tell you like, yeah, if you're a, if you're succeeding at everything you do and you know, you're, you're reaching every goal, you should be fully satisfied with your life. Me on the other hand, unless I am failing regularly, I am so unsatisfied because I know I'm not pushing myself. I know I'm not reaching for I never will know what my limits are or if I, you know, even have them, <laughs> right. you know, right. That's, that's the most unsatisfying thing for me. And, and I'm not saying it's easy to keep that mindset. Like I get frustrated constantly. Like every day I wake up and I'm like, crap, you know, I gotta, I, you know, something's going wrong with the podcast or, you know, I'm out on a hunt and I'm like, I'm I'm horrified about a shot I missed the other day or a stock I blew. Um, you know, whatever it is, it's it's not easy to keep that mindset. I'm constantly frustrated. Yeah. Um, and and I I think to myself, I'm like, if only things would just go right. But then I <laughs> but then I I also think, well, yeah, but what would be the point then? It wouldn't be any fun, right? <laughs> well, and then when they do go right. So you string everything together, you, you make a perfect stock, you make a perfect shot, you string everything together, it goes right. That is so much more rewarding and fulfilling because you know how easy it is for variables to go wrong. Like a, a, a victory, for example, if, you know, if, you're, if you're competing against somebody and you know that that individual you're competing against through, through, the, through the match or through the competition and you won, Really? Like, you're not going to be stoked about that because you know the other person threw the match and, and you know that it wasn't, it wasn't le a legitimate win. So you're not going to celebrate that. But when you actually had to push hard and, and overcome some challenges and overcome 
some mental baggage and some dialogue that you've been telling yourself about, Hey, I'm, maybe I'm not a great hunter or, or, you know, maybe I don't know how to do this or I'm in over my head on this particular hunt or whatever. And you overcome that, man, that is satisfying. That is fulfilling. That's the reward. It has to be challenging. Otherwise it's just not significant. It doesn't feel good. I think the key word you use right there is, is overcoming success. Being successful at something isn't necessarily what's satisfying about any situation. It's, it's overcoming a situation that's, that's fulfilling, that's satisfying. I think that inherently includes some sort of success, but uh, the satisfaction, but and that really defines it. Like you look at hunting, um, you can find that satisfaction without ultimately being successful in the overarching sense of it. But if you are overcoming, say, maybe your fear of staying out in the, in the wilderness for multiple days at a time, maybe that's something that makes you uncomfortable or maybe you're overcoming, you know, you've never you've never gotten within range on an elk or a deer. You've, you know, you've, you've spent plenty of time hunting them, but you've, if you're able to overcome that, then you can find satisfaction in that. And it's, uh, I think that's what really, that's probably honestly the the simplest way I've, I've, I've ever thought about it, you know, because I think we, we, we try and talk about measures of success and all these and try and define them. And I think, if you just think of it as as long as I overcome something, I can find success and fulfillment in whatever I'm doing. Right. And it doesn't have to be some catastrophic victory, some some major victory. It doesn't have to be a home run. Just be a base hit. Just get on base. Right. And then you start stringing those things together over and over and over again. You know, the runs come, the home runs come, the successes come, the ultimate victory comes, you know, just through those small and simple steps. So I think a lot of people, for example, will well. I know a lot of guys will stay out of hunting because they don't know anybody or they don't know where to start or they, they don't know how. And so like, well, I don't know how to hunt. So I guess I'm not going to hunt. It's like everybody who ever hunted in the history of mankind at one point did not know how to hunt. (laughs) They learned, right. Their father taught them like you were talking about earlier or a random person. Like my friend Colin calls up and says, Hey man, I can take you on a hunt. And and I had every reason to say no to him, right? I was busy. I didn't know him. I didn't hunt. I had to invest in equipment. I needed to do training. I'd never done it before. I got every reason to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And I spent some time getting ready and preparing, and it ended up working out well. And it got me down this path that uh, I'm, I'm extremely fulfilled and rewarded by. But if you're saying to yourself, like, I'm not going to do it because I, I, don't, I don't know if I'll be good at it. Well, you won't be good at it. That's a guarantee. <laughs> like you, you're not going to be good at it. So just embrace that for a minute while you improve, while you get better. And I say minute, and, and, and I know like I'm saying it in the grand scheme of things. You know, I look back, two years is not a lot of time, but I look back to my first two hunts, and that's like a little, just a little small window. I was in, in fact, last year, I went to Minnesota to hunt with a couple of buddies. Um, And again, somebody invited me, Sam Rodriguez invited me out there. Matt Schmigdahl is, it's his property, he manages it really well. And he says, hey, you know, the the guy said, come out here. I went out there and I left without, without a deer. And I was, I was like, I, I wasn't bitter, but I was pissed. Like I was really bugged that I spent the time and the energy and the effort and, and it just didn't come together. I was a little embarrassed too. And it just, it didn't come together. And then I went out this year, a couple of months ago and you know, I put it together and, it, and I feel like I redeemed myself and that's a cool experience, but you have to have those little setbacks in order for it to be meaningful the next year and the next go around. And you know, you bring up another good point. Like you said, you're like, I was frustrated. I felt a little embarrassed I don't think there's anything wrong with those feelings either, you know, because we do talk about like finding satisfaction in these things. Um, And a lot of the time, I think we, you know, when we talk about it, we almost take it too far. Like, Oh, if you're, if you're irritated or frustrated or embarrassed that you didn't fill a tag, you know, there you're doing something wrong. And that's, that's not the case. You know, it's like everyone is frustrated 
when they don't fill a tag. I don't care if you filled a hundred tags. If you go out for a hunt and you don't fill it, there is some frustration there. And obviously, you know, as that lessens, uh, the more you do, but, um, there's nothing wrong with being frustrated that you didn't fill a tag with being bummed out with doing, doing something stupid on a hunt, blowing a stock, whatever, you know, spooking animals and feeling a little bit embarrassed about it. It's like, yeah, you may, you understand, yeah, you're still learning, but those are natural feelings that we have as human beings. <laughs> it's not like you're not doing something wrong if you feel that way. Well, you should, you should feel that way. Like if you, well, here there's, there's multiple facets to this. First one is remorse is a powerful emotion because in normal people, it will drive them to do something different. Now, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll take the negative approach, which is, okay, I feel remorseful because, you know, I didn't complete the objective or it didn't go well. So I'm never going to do that again. It's, well, I guess hunting's just not for me. You know, I guess, guess it just wasn't meant to be. <laughs> that's, that's a negative way to approach. That's a negative behavior based on a stimulus, which is you didn't complete your objective. A, a better way to look at it is say, okay, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't complete my object, objective. It didn't go completely according to plan. So what can I do about it? How can I prove? How can I get better? Where did I break down? What do I need to fix in my training or in, in my shot sequence or whatever it is, whatever you isolate it to. So that's, that's reason number one is that remorse, sorrow, fear, embarrassment, those sorts of things will drive you to take an action. Hopefully it drives you to take a positive action. The other side of this is if, if you're not excited about, or, or I should say it this way, if you're not kind of bummed out that you didn't fill a tag, like you better check yourself because you just don't care about it enough. Which is with, and if you're talking about taking an animal's life, like that's a bad position to be in. Like if, if, if you're playing a, a game with your family and you're like, I don't care about this game. Okay, big deal. It's a game. It's, there's no like long-term implication to that. But if you're out and you're going to try to take an animal's life and you don't feel bad about like wounding an animal or, you know, if you don't, if you don't take it with that seriousness, you're in the wrong thing. And, and maybe that's okay. Maybe hunting's not for you, or maybe the other activity's not for you. But that's a good indicator. If you don't feel bad about it, like what's wrong? Like what? That's an indicator that something's off, not the fact that you feel bad. And you know what? There's no, there's no negative emotions. There's not a negative emotion. Guilt, fear, sorrow, remorse, anger, frustration, contention, envy, all of that. Those are all normal emotions they're, they're not bad it's what you do with that emotion it's it's the outcome or the response to that emotion that's going to be good or bad but an emotion is simply telling you something if you're pissed off because you botched a hunt good you should be pissed off about that hopefully it'll drive you to fix it so the next time you go on that hunt you'll be better off and you'll be a better hunter because of it that's the ultimate objective and outcome so Got to change the topic here a little bit. Um, so you mentioned you you hate fishing now, or you no oh, longer yeah. no yeah. longer like fishing. I wanted to. I wanted. What happened? <laughs> I think I just. I think I just came to this conclusion in my mind that it was like a bunch of old guys just sitting on the shore of a lake and just like sitting there drinking beers, waiting for the fish to bite. I'm like, this is stupid. I'm like, I'd rather be up. <laughs> hiking around walking around like doing something proactively so in all fairness maybe i ought to well i don't like fish either i don't i don't, I don't eat fish I don't, so that's an issue too so i was doing catch and release even in high school um but in all fairness maybe i ought to go back to float tubing or fly fishing and something that can be a little bit more active and that would engage me a little bit more um but yeah i just can't, i can't sit i'm not I, it's hard for me to just sit there and wait feels feels ridiculous <laughs> that's it's something i struggle with as well and i mean i grew up i grew up fishing too you know I, I grew up in kind of a similar way except i didn't get to move to utah yeah. um but you know i grew up with my family we'd go once a year out to a place called hume lake it's up in sequoia national forest kings canyon okay. area and uh 
we'd, we'd rent a cabin, same cabin every year uh, for is, since I think I was three years old. Cool. And we'd go fish the same lake and it was, you know, same lake, same few spots. I mean, I could, you know, I could rig tackle for that exact spot. Yeah. Like nothing. You take me anywhere else. I have no clue what I'm doing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and that, but that's what it was. It was lake fishing. You know, it was just sit on the shore. You throw it out. Like, you know, you're not really supposed to talk. You're supposed to whisper and be quiet. Right. You and know, just wait for that little bobber. It's like, I can't do this, man. Like, you know, you, you're, you're not supposed to move around cause you need to be able to feel, cause we didn't use bobbers. That was cheating. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Or, yeah. That was, was cheating for my family. Is and that so right? like, good. I think that's good actually. Yeah. So, you know, you had to keep your finger on the line, you know, and if you moved around too much, you'd be shaking the line. You wouldn't be able to feel the bite and, and all of that. I mean, and I grew up doing that and, uh, and I still do enjoy it, but I, I struggle with the sitting aspect. And I've, I've recently started trying to pick up uh, fly fishing. Yeah. And that, that I think will, uh, that will, will kind of help me out a little bit with with no my doubt. with my antsiness and and right. my desire to constantly be throwing a line out rather be than uh, active and yeah i have a couple of buddies up here <clears throat> that uh we just moved to maine i don't know if you knew that but we moved to maine uh, about six months ago so we were in southern utah desert climate i mean we didn't even have winters it maybe snowed once a year and it didn't stick overnight so now we're up here in maine and it's we're gonna get a lot of snow obviously but I have a couple of buddies who ice fish and they've invited me to go ice fishing. And I'm like, okay, so not only am I going to go sit, I'm going to go sit on a frozen lake and freeze my ass off. I'm like, I don't know if this sounds better or worse than just sitting on a lake where it's on a warm day, <laughs> but I am going to go give it a try. I'm going to give it a, give it an effort, give it a try. The guys that do it swear by it. They love it. And I'm always under the impression is like, I'll try it. You know, within reason I'll try I'll try everything once as long as it's moral, ethical, and, and legal. <laughs> I'll give it a try and see how it goes. Uh, so yeah, should should be should be good. We'll see. We'll see how it turns out. And from like I've always wanted to go ice fishing. Like I, uh, it's there's something about it. It just fascinates yeah, me, yeah. and I'm kind of the same way. I just want to at least try everything once. And uh, uh, it's always fascinating. But I, from what I understand. Every, what everyone has told me about ice fishing it was literally just an excuse to sit around with your buddies and drink beer that's what it sounds like <laughs> yeah and some guys do it right where they're like sitting in the open in the lake and other uh, I, I would say that's not the right way some guys do it right they have like these these shacks and you know yeah. they're like watching tv and they have their little barbecues there and they can cook some dogs and do their thing and watching the game and they have like a little i don't know the rigs but they have this like little rig that like trips if if a fish bites so they're just sitting there snoozing or taking a nap or dinking off or getting drunk that little thing switches and then they go fish you know fish for a minute and just reel the <laughs> thing in so we'll see I, i'm excited I, like i said i'm willing to give it a try and give it a shot and and i try to keep an open mind too because i don't want to be closed about it like oh this is stupid before i even go do it because then i'll have a bad experience mm -hmm. so i'm always open to try something you know give it a shot and see what you think well, I think, you know, as long as you go into something like that with open eyes, it's, it's, if, if you go in expecting it to be like, I don't know, like this one thing, like this big adventure thing where it's action packed <laughs> right. and you're, you're doing a lot of stuff, then yeah, of course you're going to be super disappointed and you're not going to want to like, but you know, you go in with open eyes, you can at least then find something, something to appreciate, something to enjoy about it, even if it's not fully kind of your thing. Um, right. You can at least be like, okay, there's never a bad time to hang out with your buddies. Like, exactly. even if it's just exactly. that simple, you know, yeah, you can find value in the thing I did. I will say I went fishing, fishing last year. I think it was last year with a, with a buddy from high school. His brother is a guide in Southern Utah and he took us out. And with those guys, like we had, it was fun. Like we had a really good time. We we're walking the lake and we were a lot more active and proactive and uh, we caught a few fish and that was actually a really good time. That was a lot of fun. So maybe I don't like fishing less than maybe I initially let on. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about order of man. Uh, I, you know, I really want to talk about it cause I've, I've checked it out. I've, I've read a lot about what you've got going on. Um, and I love the concept of it. And then, 
Order of Man, and as well as the Iron Council, which I think is the uh, is absolutely a fantastic thing. And so I want to I want to talk about this whole this whole brand and what you've got going on, what you're trying to do with Order of Man. Yeah, I started Order of Man in March. Yeah, March of 2015. And really, I did it for selfish reasons. I just wanted to have a podcast. I wanted to talk with highly successful men that I could learn and grow from and expand and get better and improve. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and then as I had conversations with these guys, I was noticing that men were reaching out and sending me messages and emails and saying, hey, man, I've been listening to your show for the past six months or the past year. And yeah, I've lost 40 pounds and, and my wife and I were on the rocks, but we've salvaged that. We're still in a rough spot, but you know, we're, we're mending it and we're fixing things. Or I've, I've reconnected with one of my kids that we, were, we had a hard time. We weren't seeing eye to eye on things. Uh, or I, I just started this business. I was listening to your podcast and what you were doing. And I just started this business and you know, now I'm, I'm making money and I quit my old job. So like I was seeing all of this success come from these guys who were just listening to me interview other people. So I realized pretty quickly that that we were onto something, and you know, over the past five years, we've grown that. Uh, ten, I mean, tens and millions of downloads. Uh, gosh, we're reaching millions of men on a monthly basis, and really, my ultimate objective is to give these guys the conversations they need to step up more fully in their lives, in their homes, their businesses, their communities. So we talk about everything from mindsets to physical strength and training to sets needed soft and hard skill sets for uh, growing in your entrepreneurial and career aspirations to relationship advice uh, to hobbies hunting and martial arts and other activities I mean we talk about it all so so it's good because it's all there and available for free via the podcast the YouTube channel social media profiles all that stuff but the Iron Council because you asked about that is is really order of man on steroids. So we had guys who were asking about, you know, like what, what's the next step? You know, I've been listening to the podcast. I've been doing this. Like, what do I do now? Like, what's the framework for fill in the blank? So I, I think it was in November of 2015. So it was like six or seven months after we had started. And uh, we, we launched a, a 12 week course for 12 men and we called it the iron council. And what we would do is we would take one subject, whether it was relationships or strength or mindset, whatever it was, and we would focus on it for two weeks. And then we would have discussions and there would be challenges associated with it. We get about 60 days into this thing and the guys are like, hey, like we know we're on the back end of this. We really enjoy it. We're improving our lives. Like, what do we do after this? I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you do because I don't have anything. <laughs> so we just opened it up and made Iron Council something that's available to everybody on an ongoing basis. And we have over, well, over 500 guys are members of the Iron Council now. So we're having conversations and discussions and holding each other accountable and doing challenges as teams. And it's really, really phenomenal what not only I have put together, just the guys and the movement. I don't consider this a my and mine. I consider it ours and we and it's just been really cool to see what it's grown into and how many people are not only men, but women too. Like I get messages from women who have applied what we teach and it's helping them. Uh, or uh, maybe maybe uh, their husband's out of the picture and they're trying to raise boys and they don't know how. And they're like, hey, we just really love this resource because we don't know how to talk to our boys or we don't know what to get them involved with. So this is good. And we're getting positive feedback from men and women and all over the globe. It's, it's actually kind of strange. Like I ran into somebody at the airport the other day and I was going down the escalator and this guy's like, Ryan, Ryan. And I'm like looking around cause I wasn't with anybody. And I looked down and he's coming up the escalator and I'm going down and he's like, Hey, I listened to your podcast. Can I just shake your hand? And as we're like crossing, you know, cause the escalator <laughs> doesn't stop. Like I shake his hand. He's like, thank you so much. It's, it's surreal that I have those experiences, but it's also very humbling to know that people are listening and they're inspired by the words that I'm sharing and the message that we're putting out there. And it's uh, very fulfilling and rewarding. So what, uh, you know, I've, I've read a little bit about it, but for people that haven't checked it out yet, like what, um, you know, so I sign up for the iron council. What, what happens? I, I, do I suddenly yeah. become, you know, armored warrior? What's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's all. You just, you just pay me and then all of a sudden all your wildest dreams come true and it's, you're, you're done. That's it. 
perfect. Signing nah, up right now. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, no. So when the guys come in, uh, we have an onboarding process, seven steps that get them familiar with what we're doing, uh, an introduction and overview of what the iron council is all about. Some of our philosophies and strategies and mindsets, what their experience is going to be like. And then we also ask them to commit, you know, make commitment to, to being here, to being invested, not only by paying 67 bucks a month, but like but be vested, like put time and effort and energy and be focused and prepared for your meetings. Uh, and as long as they're committed and they know that we have expectations of them and they know what, uh, our, what expectations they can have of us, we, we move them through the process from, you know, reading the book that I wrote and, and uh, when was it? Was it February of last? I think it was February of last year. Yeah. February of last year. Uh, to getting connected with a battle team. These are 12-man teams that operate inside the Iron Council to uh, filling out and completing a 12-week battle plan, which is their planning strategy for the next 90 days. So we really walk them through it. We don't hold their hands and we hold them accountable to doing it, but we give them the framework and it's up to these guys who join to actually implement the strategies and, and move forward with the processes that we talk about. It's it's really such an amazing, uh, an amazing concept. And I, I, I absolutely love it. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know about your personal beliefs, but you know, in the Bible, it talks about iron sharpening iron. And so I, I love the sure. name. Yeah. I love the concept. And uh, it's something that's lacking so much today is I don't know. It it's looked. I you know. I, I know you're super familiar with Jack Donovan, and and he and I talked a little bit about this in in the podcast I did with him. Just that it's frowned upon these days for men to have their their groups together and have that interaction. Uh, you know that manly guy time where they can build each other up and challenge each other. And if I mean what we talked about from the very beginning, un, unless you're you are being challenged how how are you going to improve you know you're not you're gonna sit where you're comfortable and i think that is something that contributes so much to the decline of of real masculinity in this world is people don't want to be challenged and they don't have the and especially men they don't have those other groups because it's frowned upon now to have right. that guy time um I mean, it's, people are sedated. You know, if you think about the average man or, or woman, you think about their life, you know, they wake up, they didn't get nearly enough sleep. They don't get nearly enough the nutrients they need in the morning when they, they eat food. You know, they, they usually just go to Starbucks and get the triple double mocha frappuccino or whatever. I'm feeling personally attacked right now, by the way, I by this. <laughs> or, yeah. Am I describing you right now? Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. Uh, they do. I mean, I'm, I'm ending this right now. <laughs> no, I'm describing me too, man. Yeah. Not, not anymore, but the old version of me. Um, they don't, they don't plan. There's no intentionality about their day. You know, they may have to commute two to two to three. I, I know people that commute almost three hours uh, one way. I'm like, bro, that's five hours a day that you're on the road commuting. Yeah, but it's like a. Yeah, I make good money. At, cool. At what cost? They're like, what do you mean? I make great money. I'm like, yes, there's a cost for your actions. You making 100 or 200 or, or seven figures even. Like, there's a cost to that. And is it worth it? Well, I don't know. Yeah, you don't know because you never thought about it. You've never given yourself the margin to think about it. This is actually the life that you want to live. And then we're inundated with these messages on Instagram and social media of like, you got to hustle, you got to grind. It's like, dude, I don't want to hustle and grind all the time. Sometimes I just want to be here and I want to roll around in the front room with my kids, or I want to go sledding in the backyard, or I want to tackle the dogs, or, or I just want to sit and read a book. We're so inundated with information. That information is usually a bunch of BS telling us what we should do and how we should behave. And all of it seems to me all designed to distract and sedate us from living a life that we really want to live that would actually be fulfilling and rewarding. And, and most of us have bought into it. And so we find ourselves in this, in this rat race of, of doing what other people tell us to do and, and to buy shit we don't need. And uh, it's just, I'm getting off on, on a soapbox here a little bit and I don't, I don't mean to do that, but 
man, it's like, what if, what if you could find the balance between being content with what you have and also pushing forward in a way that's meaningful to you? And that's what I found in my life through this movement is, uh, you know, I was a financial planner prior to this and I would have my client, my clients would call me and they'd say, Hey, you know, I need to make a, a change to my investment portfolio. I need to, I need to put some more in or take some out or rebalance it or whatever. And I would dread, I would start, I started to dread the people calling me and it would be very easy for me to continue down that path and be a financial advisor for the next 25 or 30 years. And that's what most people do. I'm not beating up financial planning because some people are excited about that. And if you are, great. But some people chase something that somebody else told them to do because that's what you're quote unquote supposed to do. And then they're miserable for the next 30 or 40 years. And then they have all this regret about what they could have done and what they should have done. It's, uh, it's rough, man. It's really rough. So I've, my eyes have been, been widened and awakened. And I hope other people's are too that you don't have to live somebody else's life and you don't need all this stuff and you don't need to make as much money as you think you do to, to live the kind of life that's rewarding and fulfilling and uplifting for you. It's interesting. I can't, I can't remember who, who kind of, I guess, inspired or taught me to do this, but I remember there is someone that talked a lot about like, you know, as uh, freelancers do this all the time, you look at your time and you put a value on your time, your health, your effort, all of this. And you look at something and you're like, okay, is this worth me? It's going to take me this much and I'm going to get this much benefit out of it. And you weigh that kind of, I guess, cost benefit analysis on your time and your life and your health. Um, right. It, it, it's something that kind of comes naturally to people that, that run their own businesses and freelance a lot of the time, or, or I shouldn't say it comes naturally, but they're, they actively do that more. And mm -hmm. so they're able to, I think, apply that to their personal life. But a lot like, you know, when I was, it took me a long time when I was working in an office on a daily basis to, to start to learn that lesson. And, you know, I mean, I, I worked in LA almost my whole life, you know, I, uh, I would commute at times, um, you know, most of the time it'd be 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half each way. I mean, that's three hours out of the day. That's awful. Um, there would be times, yeah. I, I, there were times going from, uh, going from uh, like Marina del Rey that, you know, that's kind of for those listening, that's kind of up by Santa Monica uh, somewhat and going all the way down to like Long Beach. There were times it would take me three hours to get to work. That's insane. Yeah, yeah it is. It's, it's crazy. And <laughs> It's, it's interesting because, you know, doing something else, and I know you recently had made some changes because you were talking about that in, in your professional life, but, you know, it's, people say it's risky, right? So, that, so they'll say, well, it's, that's a risk. It's a risk to quit your job. It's a risk to sell your business. Ryan, I can't believe you take so much risk moving to Maine. Oh, what's this order of man thing? That's stupid. You have a good financial planning practice. That's risky. You shouldn't do that. Oh, you're going to sell your business? What about all that residual income? Like you're taking a big risk selling it. To me, I'm like, there's the greater risk is just maintaining the status quo, right? Because let's say I come up here to Maine or I start order a man and things don't work out or go according to plan or as well as I'd like them to, okay? I can always go back. Like I can always take a step backwards. That's easy to do. It's, it's taking the step forward. The greater risk is not in pursuing things that are meaningful and interesting and engaging to you. The greater risk is that you, you maintain the status quo, you do what you're supposed to do, you toe the line and be a good little girl or boy, like society tells you to. And then you wake up one day and realize that you, 70 years of your life has passed and you are living for somebody else. You're, you're telling me that's less risky than going on an adventure, than trying something, than being bold, than, than being courageous and taking a, a calculated a weighted decision. No, it's, it's always better to push forward and try things. And I'm not saying be reckless because we have obligations, right? Like I have a wife and four kids, like they're relying upon me. So I can't go be reckless. It's uh, not like one I day you just calculated risk. woke up and decided you're like, you know what? 
screw this. I'm going to become a modern dancer. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm yeah. going to do jazz and so I'm going to quit my job and take, you know, our life savings, several hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is, and I'm just going to dump it into all of this. So, like, hang on for the ride, hun, because this is going to be awesome. <laughs> and I hear guys say that a lot, like, my wife doesn't believe in me. Yeah, well, why should she? <laughs> Have you given her reason to believe in you? Exactly, exactly. It's like, what, tell me why she should. Like, wh what, what have you done since you got married? Oh, you put on a few more pounds. You became a little bit more bitter and resentful. You may, you know, maybe you got a dollar raise over the past four years. Like, you're more disengaged with her and the family. Like, like what have you done that she's excited about? I think you're not proving that, that she made the right decision. So when you say, oh, hon, I'm going to go try this thing. Like, it's going to be awesome. And guys are like, she doesn't believe in me. No shit, she doesn't believe in you. And, and even to add all on top of all that is like, you're risking her livelihood as well. So yeah, you got to get that stuff straightened out. If you want people to buy into what it is you're doing and get them on board. That's one of the things I hear all the time. How do I get my wife to believe in me? Take the trash out when you say you will for the next 12 months. Be when you come home after work and you say, hon, I'll be here and I'll be present for you and the kids, put your damn phone away and be present for her and the kids. Right. Or if, or if there's a project around the house and you say, Hey, yeah, you know, hon, I know you want those shelves put up. I'll put them up this weekend, put the damn shelves up that weekend. And then you'll start, she'll start believing in you because your words match your actions, or I should say your actions match your words. That's how you get people to believe in you. That's one thing, you know, we, uh, we had, we talked earlier about this, you know, we had some, uh, confusion over timing and, and we, uh, rescheduled this a couple of times and, uh, one of the things I really appreciated um, when you emailed me back was, you know, we were looking at some different time options. And, and again, you know, you're out in Maine, I'm over over here uh, in California. And so a bit of a time difference. And uh, you just mentioned, you're like, nope, sorry, that's family time. Def I, like, there was no question. Like, it wasn't even like, oh, uh, let me see what we're doing. And, and if I'm free, I'll, I'll get back to you. It was like, nope. That's family time. And I thought that was really powerful. I really appreciated that when and respected that when I saw that message. Um, and so it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very small thing, but it's, it's cool to see you living, you walking the walk. Um, you know, you're living this message that you're preaching. So um, I just wanted to use that as a small there's a, Well, there's a couple. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. There's a couple examples there. Like, let's, let's extract a couple of different things from that. So number one, it, you know, we're talking about being a person of your word. And here we are talking about me. And it, w it was my fault, me screwing up the time zone and missing our first, our first podcast. I'm not saying things don't happen, right? Like, I'm not saying you have to be perfect, because they do happen. You, you, you forget stuff, or you overbook, or, you know, an emergency, like stuff happens. That's okay. Just fix it when it happens. And don't like let it keep happening again, over and over the other thing that you mentioned about um, when I said, no, that I can't do after five, it's family time. And I was very, take a hard line stance on that. I used to, that was hard for me to do because I used to believe that, that it would make me look bad, right? Or, or that other people would be put out. And I was so consumed with like worrying about what their deal was, what they perceived me and thought of me that I would like shift my schedule around and tweet. And it's like, okay, well, I can do this and this. And then I realized what happened is, and I actually think I had this happen in a podcast once. I, I jeopardized the standard. So I said, yeah, dude, I'll do like six o'clock at night. And I remember doing the podcast and I got done with that podcast. And I was so bitter and like butthurt that I was there at six o'clock at night that the podcast wasn't good. Like I just didn't perform well on the podcast and I did that individual a disservice because I compromised my own and my own boundary. What I've realized, and this comes through practice is that the more I can just be clear and concise about who I am, what I stand for, what I'll do, what I won't do. And I communicate that effectively to other individuals. And you just said it. I respect you for that. It's not that people disrespect you for that. They actually appreciate that because people aren't willing to do it. Most 
a waffle. Most people will, you know, they're back and forth and it's, it's, it's crazy. I use this context a lot when, when I talk about, um, if you're, if you're dating a woman and she's having sex with you before you're committed to each other, it's like, dude, if she's having sex with you before you're committed to each other, don't you think that maybe she'd be open to having sex with somebody else before she's committed to that person? <laughs> like it's, be smart about this, right? Like you'll know an individual by what they do. And even though you may not like fully appreciate the, their standard, most people respect a standard because they know that there's a person who knows what they want. They uphold their standard. They're confident. They're assertive. Their time and command their attention. People love that because it's so, it's not common. People are willing to compromise all the time. And it's, it's, it's not a good look. It's really not a good look. Compromise is one of those interesting words and concepts to where it has such positive connotations, I guess, and such negative ones as well, where it's, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and it takes a lot of self-awareness in your own life to know, um, when compromise is a positive thing and when it's a negative thing you have to know what you you have to have a certain self awareness to understand your values what is important and what is healthy for you to understand like yeah this is something i cannot compromise my i cannot compromise my time with my family i cannot you know compromise my morals my ethics whatever whatever those hardline things are but then you have to understand, like, uh, you know, sometimes we do have to compromise on things to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, hey, I'm sure you've never had to compromise on anything with your with your wife or uh, as far as <laughs> <laughs> something she wants yeah. to do or versus. Well, look, Deanne, you, yeah, I mean, you're you're dead on with this. You're you're dead on with this. Is it's a it's a tough thing to balance. But communication is the answer, right? So what a lot of people will do is they'll have this expectation of the way that life should work or the relationship with their spouse will work and they fail to communicate it to the other person. And then they get all upset that the person crossed the boundary or didn't uphold an expectation that that individual failed to communicate, right? Like I can't, I, I can't be pissed off if, well, an example. Let's say, and this is just to, to kind of illustrate the point, but let's say that I schedule, uh, I don't know, I, I schedule like fight nights for set night. The guys come over, we're going to have a good time. We're going to watch the fights. We're going to have fun. And I don't communicate that to my wife. And then she, sched because I didn't communicate it, she looks at the calendar. She's like, oh yeah, Saturday night's open. She schedules something with her girlfriends and, and she wants me to watch the kids while she's out with her girlfriends. And then she comes over to me and she says, Hey, um, I'm going to go out Saturday night with some of the girls. I can just want to let you know, we just, we take care of the kids tonight. I don't have any right to be pissed off about that because I failed to communicate what was happening. Like that was a failure on my part. Right. And, and maybe some guys will say, well, she should ask, maybe she should have asked too. Like, Hey, do you have anything going on Saturday night? But you, that could have been completely alleviated if you would have just communicated the expectation. Hey, hon, just so you know, like I'm, I'm planning on inviting the guys over. And so uh, you keep the, the schedule clear and you have the kids night or whatever, right? Then all of that is gone. But what most people will do is they'll blow up at somebody else for crossing a boundary that they didn't know existed. And that's your fault if that happens. So, the, so, so when you're talking about compromise, making sure that the communication or the, it's all communicated. The other side is like when you do have to make a compromise, it's fine, but just just rectify the situation. So another example. So last night, or excuse me, um, okay, yeah, Wednesday night. So I usually go train jujitsu Wednesday night, okay? So she comes to me about three or four in the afternoon and she, hey, hon, do you want to, uh, do you want to have a date on Wednesday night? And in my head, I'm like, oh, that's jujitsu night. But I could tell she was really excited about it. And so, yeah, I do want to do that. Like, let's go on a date. And in my mind, I'm like, shit, I'm going to miss jujitsu. Like I'm trying to be consistent and regular about it. So there's like this internal conflict going on. I just went the next morning to jujitsu. <laughs> like, so you make up for it, right? 
and, and you can have both. That's the beauty. So I got to go on a date with my wife to, to edify her. And we spent time together and that was fun. And, and that was good. And I also got jujitsu in. I just adjusted the schedule a little bit and made it work. So those are the compromises Like you could still meet your expectations and your standards. Timelines may have to shift just based on circumstances. And there's, you know, there's something you're kind of talking about the, the idea of, you know, the guy's night and your wife wanting to go out and, uh, the, that communication. And it's just an interesting thing is like you said, you brought up, you know, the point of like, some guys may say like, well, she should have, she should have asked me if I had any plans before she made her plans. And, uh, I'm like, that is my immediate reaction to that was like, that is like the least masculine thing I've ever heard is you are literally putting all of that on your wife. You're taking zero responsibility you're not taking the lead in this situation like completely uh, just it just like you said that and like ah uh, it made me cringe it, it just kind of made my stomach turn <laughs> listening to that i was just like yeah Ugh. but it's funny because the guy who would say that it's like well you didn't you didn't ask her when you made your plans so like why why are you expecting her to ask you mm -hmm. well because i'm i'm the leader i'm in charge <laughs> I mean, you can still lead and, and ask for people's input and fill in your, your people, if you will, on what's going on. Well, how are you a leader if you're not telling those that you're leading what's going on? Like, come on. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. But people overlook it all the time. All the time. Communication is a, is a major, major problem for everybody. Um, uh, you know, I have people very close to me who struggle with communication and struggle with telling people in their lives what needs to be said. <laughs> it's just, and it just creates way more problems than it needs to. And I don't want to hear about it. They'll come to me and tell me, well, this person, this, and this person, go talk to them, man. Like, go, you go talk to them. That's who you need to communicate with. I'm not involved in this. You go communicate with them and work it out. <laughs> but people struggle with it. It represents potential conflict is a, is a challenge for people. So uh, as we're winding down, I, I always like to ask, um, you know, as we talk, talked earlier, I kind of focus this podcast on reaching out to people that um, may not have that, that longstanding background in hunting and the outdoors. And, and, you know, as we even talked about, you know, at some point, you have to learn to hunt somehow like you know everyone that right. had hunted had to learn to hunt somehow and so you know say there's somebody that grew up maybe similar to how we did where it was just camping you know a couple times a year is like a fun family vacation or and and they don't have they don't have friends they don't have uh family that really does this but they want to get into the outdoors they want to get into hunting fishing um but maybe they're intimidated they just don't know where to start what advice or words of wisdom would you give to that person? Yeah. So I, I did a, I don't know if I did a podcast or a, I don't know, a post on this not too long ago. So it's, it's good. Cause it's all fresh in my mind. The first look to your inner circle. And I know you said they don't hunt or whatever, but, but look, I mean like seriously look with the intent of finding somebody who hunts, you might actually find somebody who's who hunts or fishes or hikes or just is outdoors or camps and, and knows the outdoors. But if you're actually and actively looking and inventorying the people in your circle, you might find somebody that you've overlooked because that wasn't on your radar. So first things first, look to your inner circle. And if there's somebody who you know is big into hiking, just ask them if you can go on a hike. That actually will lead you into hunting itself because you're just moving in the right direction. So you don't need to become the, the best hunter in the world initially. You just go on a hike with somebody and that person is going to share the and share the experience and you're going to learn stuff or or maybe somebody fishes hey can i tag along when i started hunting i actually had friends who i knew hunted and i asked them i've probably been on half a dozen or so hunts where i don't have a tag so i, I just asked them hey i you know i know you hunt it's hunting season like do you have any hunts coming up would you mind if i tag along i promise i'll be quiet i'll do what you say and i'll help <laughs> like like if you approach it like that, everybody's willing to share because they're excited about it. If somebody came to me and said that and said, Hey Ryan, like, I know you're hunting. I'm excited about hunting. I'll be quiet. I'll do what you say. I'll help you carry stuff. <laughs> Man, 
you're in. You're hired. I do not know a a single hunter that would turn down somebody that's like, hey man, I will help you pack out. I'll you know exactly. help you carry gear. I'll you know help you make food. I'll take do photos. video. I'll take pictures and do video for you. Oh yeah. man. I do not know yeah, man. a single person that would turn that down. And I mean, what you can learn from the, you, I guarantee you could learn more from observing without a tag than you will ever, if you're, if you're focused on filling a tag while you're following this person around. Like when you're a focused observer, uh, it's. Oh yeah. You're going to learn it, so much. Hand over fist different, but. Yeah. So I would say that's one strategy. Uh, another, another thing is, I mean, you're listening to this podcast. There's a thousand other podcasts that focus on hunting and fishing and outdoors. There's magazines, there's journals, there's social media accounts, there's YouTube channels. Uh, one that I followed in particular is John Dudley, not TV. Um, I learned so much about archery and releases and bows and how to shoot and everything else from watching YouTube videos of that guy shoot. Yeah, I actually had him on the podcast too a couple of times. That one avenue is look to people who are doing it. And then the third avenue is just go to your your uh, wildlife resource management office. Every state calls it something different. Just go in there and just start picking up resources, like picking up their hunting guide for the year. Picking like they have a vested interest in educating uh, those who want to hunt and help conserve. Uh, wildlife help conserve nature so the resources they have on the fishing guides the hunting guides the rules regulations where to go where you can't go all that stuff's invaluable and it's all right there and it's all free because they want you to have it so tap into your friends tap into social media and influencers who are doing this stuff and then tap into your wildlife resource department and you're gonna look want to hunt you're gonna find a way to hunt and if you don't but you say you're but you don't really want to then you're going to find all kinds of little like i can't i don't know anybody i don't know how to do it. if you really wanted to do it you would go do it you would find a way and there's three ways you can do it so if folks want to follow along with what you're doing online where can they find you and also where can they find order of man yeah 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 so uh well podcast is a great place since you're listening to a podcast now so just type in order of man wherever you're listening in the podcast and you'll find ours i think we've done gosh over 500 episodes now we've been going for uh almost five years so the other place is youtube we've got a video the video podcast as well order of man on youtube and then on social media the, the place i'm active most is on instagram at ryan mickler my last name is spelled m-i-c-h-l-e-r so if you follow at ryan mickler you'll connect with me shoot me a message. Let me, you listen to the podcast. I try to get back to everybody who shoots me a message. It's becoming increasingly difficult. I try to stay social on social media. So. Awesome. Well, I will make sure to uh, put all of this up on the show notes page. That will be uh, the wild initiative.com slash one twenty eight. Uh, Y'all can find everything over there. Uh, any, uh, before we sign off, any final closing thoughts? Go hunt like go enjoy nature like there's so much out there and it's it's fulfilling it's rewarding it's challenging but it'll make you a better human being so find somebody who's doing it tag along with them and uh go make the most of the resources that we have on this planet because uh it's pretty incredible when you tap into it awesome man well thank you so much for taking the time i'm glad we were able to finally sync up and put this one down I had a great time chatting with you thanks brother appreciate you all right, y'all, that'll do it for episode 128 of The Wild Initiative. Big thank you to Ryan for hopping on. Make sure y'all check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com slash 128. Get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Make sure you check out Order of Man. Give it a subscribe. And go check out the Iron Council on the website. Well, y'all, that will do it for today. Uh, I hope this podcast inspired you to uh, get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 